This is all that's left. Ghostly shadows. A monument in stone and bronze. Located on the desolate side of a roadway. All but forgotten. Join us for the distressing history of the fishing village that vanished from Terminal Island on PCZ TV. Today's episode, The Vanished Village. 1853. The U.S. sends Admiral Perry's Black Fleet to force open Japan to American trade and commerce. I mean, how dare they not want to trade with the West? Don't they know that we have people to exploit? Whaling ships that need coaling ports and a new market for our goods? This directly led to the Meiji Restoration and a complete overhaul of Japanese society. Japan was forced open. Foreigners could get in and the Japanese could now get out. Ironically, it was the passing of the Chinese Exclusionary Act which hastened the flow of Japanese immigrants into America. The U.S. initially encouraged Chinese immigration as a form of cheap labor, but over time began to see the Chinese as the yellow peril. Laws were passed, Chinese immigration dried up, and many were forcibly repatriated, and the cheap labor they provided disappeared. Meanwhile, Japan may have technically won the Russo-Japanese War, but the peace treaty did not provide any indemnities from Russia, and Japan, therefore, was left on the edge of bankruptcy. Her economy was in shambles. Needless to say, these conditions drove many Japanese to leave and head for better economic conditions. American businesses welcomed the new arrivals to replace the cheap labor the Chinese immigrants had previously provided. Japanese arrivals peaked in 1907 with as many as 30,000 Japanese immigrants. Many moved to the South Bay. Fishing and farming were popular occupations for the new arrivals, and it was a fishing village established on Terminal Island that we'll focus on today. But Terminal Island wasn't the only Japanese-centric village or Japantown in California. California has a project preserving the memory of these locations, and in a future video, we'll tour the last Japanese farm on the Palos Verdes Peninsula. In the early 1940s, Terminal Island housed a vibrant community of nearly 3,000 Japanese and Japanese-American residents. It had helped launch a booming industry for canned tuna. Originally known as Rattlesnake Island due to the snakes that would gather after torrential storms, it had recently been renamed after its new owner, the Los Angeles Terminal Railway. A dozen or so Japanese fishermen first settled on Terminal Island at the turn of the 20th century. Back then it was still a rural stretch of land with around 200 homes. Now what stimulated the move to Terminal Island was that the Japanese fishermen were forced to disband their abalone camp in nearby White Point. Although quite successful initially, they had been forced to move operations as local anti-Japanese sentiment increased and culminated in a 1905 state law that prohibited Japanese from fishing for abalone. In 1903, Terminal Island's first and only cannery at the time, the California Fish Company, perfected a method for canning tuna. They marketed it as an affordable substitute to chicken. This became the destination for the newly displaced Japanese fishermen. They soon proved to be masters of commercial tuna fishing, and they worked alongside immigrants from Italy, Yugoslavia, and Croatia. If Monterey Bay was famous for its canned sardines, Terminal Island was famous for its tuna. On a side note, there is still a large and vibrant Croatian community in San Pedro. Word spread quickly back to Japan of the success to be had at Terminal Island, and by 1907, an estimated 600 Japanese fishermen operated out of the area. This wave of immigrants came mainly from the 
Wakayama, and Shizuoka areas of Japan. Most fishermen working with the canneries had contracts, and their wives often worked there as well. Terminal Island essentially became a company town, with nearly 3,000 Japanese residents. The aptly named Tuna Street was the center of commerce, with dozens of Japanese-owned stores and restaurants. The tiny neighborhood also boasted a pool hall, several Buddhist temples, a judo hall, fisherman's hall, a Baptist church, a bank, and Shinto shrines. It really was a slice of Japan and America. These terminal islanders created a hybrid culture of their homeland and the new home. And they kept the traditions of their homeland alive, everything from mochi making, kendo schools, sake making, and Japanese social clubs. But all was not fun in the sun. The 1918 California State Fishing Bill prohibited Japanese aliens from owning their own boats, causing many of the locals to change from boat ownership to being skippers of boats owned by the canneries. As such, it became more of a factory town. The cannery offered company-owned rental housing. These were long wooden barrack buildings with quarters that varied by size depending on their renter's job. There would be as many as four families living in one building. Only the main streets were paved. The alleys between the houses were filled with sand. But with their livelihood dependent on the fresh catch, a 24-hour whistle often called the women to the factory in the middle of the night. And with their fathers at sea and the mothers at the factory, children would fend for themselves and their younger siblings. December 7, 1941 changed Terminal Island forever. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Terminal Islanders became suspect for owning boats and for the shortwave radios they used to communicate to the canneries. These folks were the first to be searched by the FBI and taken into custody. All traffic to and from the island was suspended. Within 48 hours, about 1,300 Issei, Japanese immigrants, had been arrested and detained. The families of these men, the women and children, were left to fend for themselves financially and otherwise, leaving many families in dire straits for months. At first, the remaining residents were given a 30-day eviction notice. But later in December, after eight ships were attacked by Japanese submarines off the west coast of the U.S., with two sunk and two damaged, the hysteria grew and led to the mass evacuation from the island with a 48-hour notice. The village became a ghost town, patrolled by armed soldiers. Oh, but this was just a harbinger of things to come. In, in one of the most egregious events in modern American history would lead to massive civil rights violations. On a national level, the House Un-American Activities Committee had been stirring up anti-Japanese sentiment for several years. They accused the Terminal Island fishermen of being spies, but the worst was yet to come. On February 19, 1942, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, ultimately sending 120,000 Japanese Americans to internment camps. Never mind the fact that there was no government infrastructure to assist with the relocation and evacuation. The military responded and sent soldiers with rifles and bayonets to enforce the order. This is the face of evil. General DeWitt used the authority that Order 9066 granted to him to issue military proclamations. He was the one who specifically ordered the removal and internment of the Japanese, regardless of citizenship status. According to DeWitt, a Jap is a Jap, whether a U.S. citizen or not. Well, he and his equally racist lackey, Colonel Carl Bedenson, authored a final report that laid out the position that, quote, race made it impossible to determine loyalty, thus necessitating internment for all. The original version was so offensive that even in the atmosphere of wartime 1940s, 
it underwent multiple redactions, and eventually all copies were ordered to be destroyed. In a sad twist of fate, Carl Bendetson was Jewish, and he was writing such racist vitriol at the same time that the Nazis were spouting out similar horrible lies about European Jews. The U.S. at least only had a final report and not a final solution. But racism on this level is unforgivable. This is what I find most distressing. By April, the last of the Japanese on the West Coast had boarded trains for internment camps where they would spend the next few years. Most Terminal Island residents were incarcerated at Manzanar for the duration of the war. If you're passing by this location on your way to skiing, please visit. It's a very sad piece of American history, but one which deserves to be remembered. After the evacuation of the islanders, the Navy demolished all of the residents' homes and nearly all of the other structures, including the churches, temples, and shrines. Well, with the end of the war, I wish I could say there was a happy ending. But there wasn't. Post-war, things weren't terribly rosy for the islanders. Animosity towards Japanese fishermen continued. And during the war, the state passed an amendment to a 1933 statute of the California Fish and Game Code, which specifically targeted the Japanese fishermen and made it impossible for them to ever get a commercial fishing license. The objective was to try to dissuade any Japanese from returning from the internment camps back to California. Post-war, as with all cases where California state tries to deny civil rights, 2A, I'm looking at you, the state fought tooth and nail to keep these regulations in place. Toreo Takahashi who had been one of the approximately 700 licensed Issei commercial fishermen working in California before the war, took on the state. After going through all the lower courts, eventually the California Supreme Court in 1947 ruled in favor of the state. Yes, you heard that right. Eventually the fight went to the Supreme Court of the United States that ruled in favor of Takahashi. The court held that this was an unreasonable restriction and was discriminatory to residents and citizens of Japanese ancestry. And that ends the tale of the vanishing village. Or does it? Terminal Island was the only community that vanished entirely. Today, it is literally a shipping and receiving terminal for shipping containers. 18-wheelers constantly come and go. However, it may be gone, but it's not forgotten. In 2002, a memorial was dedicated at Fish Harbor. And so we end as we began, with ghostly figures reminding us of a time long ago and a village that vanished. I hope you enjoyed this dive into South Bay history. If you've been watching, I thank you. Bye.